scriptures up to 1 Samuel. I'm going to read from 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 3, and then 1 Samuel verse 17, chapter, chapter 17, verse 45, where uh, Brother Fulkushan already touched on a bit. Verse 3. Year after year, this man went up from his, own, from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Now, First Samuel chapter 17, verse 45, it says, David said to the Philistine, you come against me with a sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord of hosts the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Amen. You may be seated. Before we go into developing those texts I read, I want to start with testimony. How Adonai Tsevaot always fights for us, and he has never lost a, a battle. I would like the brothers in the back to kind of keep the first image I sent them to kind of have that for a while as I speak and as I go through this. Um, as you guys know, uh, I've been blessed with uh, nine children, and um, I've always sort of kind of uh, unknowingly, maybe sometimes arrogantly boasted how uh, God has taken care of all my children, and all the deliveries were perfect, nothing went wrong, and kind of uh, just maybe didn't realize or maybe took for granted um, the blessings of health that's been of my family. Um, also, when I choose my children's name, sometimes you may think I run out of names, but believe it or not, there's plenty of names out there still. Uh, some people choose their names because uh, it sounds cool. Some people um, want their names to be like some name, some inventor of some sort or somebody famous. Not always, or, not, or, or I shouldn't say not from the beginning all the time. I've, I've always tried to pick a name that uh, was significant for that child, but I've been doing it for probably since Eva Down or maybe Jonah Down, can't remember exactly, where I really asked the Lord, Lord, what exactly, how exactly do you want me to name these children? And we know that Jonah and Jude start with J's, so I wanted to stay in the J's. I have three sons. Uh, I'm thinking that I'm done having children, so maybe I'll have three J's. And I kept praying and praying, Lord, guide me. How should I name my son? And the name Joab, I was just stuck with. I could not shake off. It doesn't matter. People try to send me all their names. Some people try to bribe me. They'll make a house payment if I name them after themselves. But it didn't work. I was stuck on Joab. And of course, we have to put Luke to compliment Joab. Um, so Joab, Luke is his name. But I didn't, I didn't realize I put a name of a fighter. And little did I realize he would fight already from the womb. I don't know how, I'm not sure how many you guys know, but I know a lot of you guys have prayed for Joab. Uh, from the beginning, from one of his ultrasounds, um, there was uh, people, uh, the doctors you know, kind of scared us and sent this uh, note home or called us first and then sent the results home. And they said, uh, we found something and we think there's a high chance that your son has Down syndrome. And, um, you know, it shook us up. It shook us up because I took health for granted. And um, don't take health for granted. It's a blessing to be healthy in today's world. And um, you know, it, it shook us up. And the doctors are funny because then we had to do another test result and they make you wait like two weeks. Now imagine two weeks of praying God, you know, heal him, heal if, if this is it. But if not, we're always, even making plans, okay, we know we're going to love this boy no matter what. There's plenty of the people who are going through this, and they love their children. And, 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 and it's, it's possible to, to have a life and, and to go through it like this. It's not that bad. And we're, like, making all this. A lot of emotions went through our minds in that very moment. Um, sure enough, you guys prayed. My family prayed. And the test result came back, and they said everything was normal. I was like, thank God. Thank you, Jesus. Um, then the delivery process. Um, 
the baby wasn't turning. He was head down, but not face up. And we're going, okay, what's going on? Why is he not doing his thing? God made design the baby to roll and do whatever it needs to do. It's a perfect design by God. But it wasn't happening. Um, so we had to induce the labor. As we go in um, for the labor, um, we had a midwife, and she was like, what's the baby's name? I was Joab. They're like, okay. So the name became the general. So the baby's name throughout the hospital it was the general. The general is coming. He's about to come. So he's the general. So that whole floor, the nurses knew that he's the general. And um, when he came out, he came with his umbilical cord really tight around his neck. It was so tight that I remember the doctor saying, hold on, let me try to take the cord off his neck. And I remember her face changed and said, no, it's too tight. Just push, it's too tight. And the baby was born really blue. Uh, I've seen deliveries. Uh, I should be an expert at seeing deliveries by now. I know how a baby should look and what they should do when they come out of the womb. And he was so blue, and I kept asking, uh, what's wrong with them? What's wrong? And they wouldn't answer because they were in doing their job mode. They were not going to give me answers in that very moment. Um, but I had a, a weird feeling before that. It was, I knew something. I can't describe it to you. I just knew something is happening. Almost like a battle is about to unfold. I, I can't describe it. I was telling Anna, she kept asking, are you good? Me, I'm all good. She's about to give delivery, ask me, are you good? And I'm thinking, it just, I was like, yeah, everything's fine. I'm just happy to be here, you know, playing it off. But it's something I cannot describe. Something was going on. But thank God, after that, he started breathing. He started crying. He started pinking up. And everything was good. And glory to God, again. Then, of course, the doctors come in and, and they check his heart. And it's like we hear, we, we hear a murmur in his heart. Something could be off. Whether it's normal or not, I don't know. Again, we began to pray. And it was like battle after battle after battle. Um, that went away. Then we go home. They, send, they do a test where they prick the heel. Then we get this test results back saying, well, he's borderline autoimmune, where his immune system does not fight. And we're like, what is next? Like, I know all these. I should be a doctor by now because I know all these terms that the doctors keep telling me about that I haven't heard. So, again, we began to pray, and of course, they take forever with the test results. I don't know why they don't do that. They can locate life on Mars, but they can't give you a test result the same day. And they keep you waiting forever. Uh, but in that moment, we began to pray again. And again, of course, God came through. He said, no, everything was fine after the second test. Glory to God. And you think it will be done. This Friday, I got to work in my car. I souped up my van of 12 passengers. It's a little it's 20 horsepower more now with the colder intake. Um, had to keep the manliness going. Um, and I get home from AutoZone with the part that I needed. And the whole family just meets me on the side door and comes in and they say, Jude stop breathing. Joab stopped breathing. Joab stopped breathing. I'm like, what do you mean? I drop everything down. I go and I grab my, chi my child and I just say, Jesus, I said, Jesus. And my daughter said, are you speaking in tongues? Because she was like, I, that's how it sounded like. I don't know if I was or not, if the Holy Spirit was just taking over in that moment because I had nothing else to rely on but him. But I know I kept saying, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And again, he began to catch his breath. I don't know what happened. He just, for a while, he just stopped breathing. And he wasn't breathing for some time. And they were with the ambulance and the phone. They came in, they looked at him and said, well, he's fine now. What do you want to do, go to the hospital or not? I said, no, we're good. And began to lay hands over him and pray over him as a family. What do I want to say with all this? I want to say I'm about to, because in that moment, my mind, and I said out loud, I said, isn't it funny, I'm about to speak about Lord Adonai Tzavaot, the God who fights. And here I am fighting. Joab is fighting. And we often want a breakthrough in life. And we say, I just want a breakthrough. Whatever that means, I'm not entirely sure, but I know that if you want to break through, you, want to you have to break through something. It involves a battle. And many times in life, I think we, we face so many battles, and we have probably have appealed to this God, Tzavaot, Adonai Tzavaot, that we didn't realize we're, 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 there's a battle about to unfold in our lives. And I want to say that to all the battles that I felt like I went on, that went on in our family recently and, and with the baby and everything, I want to say that Adonai Tzavaot has always been on our side. 
never left us alone. He has an undefeated record of a million and billion and zero. He has never been defeated and he never will lose a battle. So with this testimony, I just want to give glory to him because I've seen the working hand of God fighting for us in this season. And now I can say that next Sunday, I'm bringing Joab Luke, a fighter, to be dedicated to the Lord. And with that, I want to invite every single one of you to that occasion and rejoice with me because I'm going to bring a fighter before you. So watch out. Amen. And I want to kind of give a backstory to Adonai Tzavaot. Uh, the reason I'm saying it this way is because I have a Messianic Jewish friend, and that's how he says it, Adonai Tzavaot. So I figured that's the correct way of saying it. Um, so I was, began to look into what this means, and I've asked him. I said, you know, I have this connection. He has a ministry called Together for Israel. I figured, what better person to ask than a Messianic? I mean, I'm sure he has some insight. So I write to him and said, hey, uh, Scott, is there anything that you can give me some great insight that I may not be aware of? Anything that I'm missing? I mean, I'm doing all the res research I can possibly think of, but is there something I've missed? Because I'm a Gentile. You know, when I read the scripture, I'm reading it from the 21st century. I'm missing something, I'm pretty sure. And he says to me, I'm going to read part of his text, text and it says, Adonai Tzavaot is the most used name of God in the scripture. More than healer, more than provider, more than anything else. He is the God of armies, and he has never lost a battle or ever will. Amen. That deserves an amen. Amen? So he's never lost a battle. It's the most mentioned name of God in the scripture, Adonai Tzavaot. And we probably never even realized that. So I began to look into that. Jehovah Tzavaot, over 285 times. Jehovah Jireh, once. Jehovah Nisi, once. Jehovah Shalom, once. Jehovah Rohi, in Psalm 23, once. Jehovah Mekodishkem, twice, if I'm saying that right. Jehovah Rapha, more than 60 times. Jehovah Tzitkenu, twice. El Elyon, 19 times. El Shaddai, 48. And Emmanuel, three times. Now, these names do not include Elohim, which is more than 2,000 times, Yahweh over 6,500 times, Adonai more than 400 times, because these names are actually used to narrow down the one true God of Israel. So, for example, at the beginning when, when, when God came on the scene in Genesis, I'm Elohim, I'm God. So it was, it was an announcement to the world, I'm God, I'm here on the scene. So it was another way of saying God. When Yahweh happened, it was when Moses um, was being sent out and called by God himself from the burning bush. And he's saying, well, who's sending me? Wh whose God is sending me? And he said, I'm Yahweh. I'm, I'm God. Again, I'm, he was about to combat the gods of Egypt. And then when Adonai came in, the scene was where Abraham was called. And he said, where, where, who's this? This is Adonai. Why was that important? I'm the Lord. I'm master. I'm the only one. Because Abraham was living in the land of Chaldeans, in the land of pagans. So it was important for God to say, listen, I am the master. I am the Lord of all the other nonsense around you. So Elohim, Yahweh, Adonai is another way to narrow down the one true God. It's not, and the other names I mentioned before are the names that also describe what God does. So that's why Tzavaot is the most mentioned in, in the attributes and, and the characters of God, what he does. So I thought that was really cool. I've never known that. I was kind of jealous that uh, Brother Florin Gale had preached from Jair because I thought I had something very cool going with Jair, and I was hoping it would land on me, but he didn't. And I was like, what, what do I got to say about Tzavaot? I don't know much. But I'm so happy I got to learn because in the same way, when God would present his attributes, his names to us, was when somebody needed to get more or, or to know him more, or when God wanted to present himself to us in other ways. Just like our Christian faith, our walk, the more we walk with him, the more we know of him, the more we know who he is, the more, the more we experience that close fellowship. In the same way, God, when he presented us with his names, with his attributes, was in seasons when he wanted to present more of himself. So our duty as his children is to continue to walk with him 
so we, so we may discover more of him. Amen? Um, so as I mentioned in 1 Samuel verse, chapter 1, verse 3, in that passage with, with, uh, with Hannah, which we'll get into a little bit, it's the first time Adonai Tzevaot is mentioned in that passage, which is significant, and we'll get to it. But we need to go to Numbers 1-3 to understand a little bit of that passage better. So Numbers 1-3 says, You and Aaron are to count according to their division all the men in Israel, all who are 20 years old or more, and are able to serve in the army. Now, the word for army or war, depending which translation you're reading, the word used there is tzava. Now the word tzava can mean a battle, a host, a military, service, army, or war. So in that passage, use tzava. Tzavaot's literal translation means armies. So I know that also in our Bibles, it's n numerous times it's translated the Lord of hosts. Well, it might not make sense to us from a Gentile perspective, but from a Jew Jewish perspective, they would, it would make sense because it has that word tzava in there. So it would know that the Lord of hosts means the Lord of many armed men. The Lord of many armed men. They, they knew that the message is a battle or a service or something's going on. So um, a literal translation of Adonai Tzavaot is the Lord of armies. The Lord of armies. So that's a little bit of, of the background behind Adonai Tzavaot. It's, it's amazing. And I'm, and I'm glad that you know, I didn't know all this about Adonai Tzavaot. And it's, it's powerful because how many times in our, in our daily lives we might have cried, Oh Lord God, go before me. Oh Lord God, help me. We apply to Adonai Tzavaot in that moment. Even when you need healing, you have to fight. Prayer, fasting, there's a fighting going on. We'll get to that. Financial, maybe help. There's a fight going on. You're not going to just sit and let a million dollars fall in your lap. I would love for that to happen. I'm waiting for that moment. But it hasn't happened yet. Hopefully soon. But I want the brothers to kind of get the second slide. Not yet, but the second picture ready in just a couple of seconds. I just want to say, since our God is the Lord of armies, indicating that he himself is a mighty warrior from whom none can compare to his record of being undefeated, shouldn't we have that same attribute in us? We are told to imitate God, Ephesians 5.1. We are told that we are born of God, John 1, 13. We are told in Romans 8, 29, that we are predestined to be conformed in his image. Plus the endless stories of the early church of people who fought, fought, even if their own life was on the line. Hebrews 13, 7, it says, remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. I mean, there's people who fought before us, the early church, imitate their faith. Everybody wants to be the next Wilkerson and Billy Graham, but what about the ones from the Bible who, who, who lived in such a way where they knew their life was in danger every single day and fought for it? Consider the outcome and imitate them. Second Timothy uh, chapter 2, verse 4, it says, No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affair, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. In the Old Testament, it might have meant um, the Lord of hosts as implication of heavenly, like angelic army. But I'm going to tell you something. In the New Testament, we are part of God's armies. We are part of his army. We have a commanding officer. Me and you were soldiers. We are, we are on a mission to, to continue the works of, of Jesus Christ, which he started at the cross to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. And we are going to fight because there's an enemy who constantly tries to, to derail those plans, to constantly try to stop those plans from happening. So if I can use this analogy and I would like the second picture to please come up. If God is a lion, as analogy, he doesn't give birth to kitty cats. They might be cute, but they're not warriors. 
at best they'll scratch you and bite you. And unfortunately, that's a representation of many Christians. Because they don't, they don't understand who their Heavenly Father is. They don't understand who they're born of. So they get close. So we use what we are to scratch at each other. And there's division, and there's biting, and there's envious. And at best, we're kitty cats. This is not what, this is not what God had in mind, to just come close. We are his imagers. From the beginning, he said, we're going to make a man in what? Our image. Not close. So put the claws down and start walking boldly, knowing who your heavenly father is. Amen. And now, the third picture, come up, please. No, a lion will bring forth other lions. And a little disclaimer, somebody said, are those lioness? No, I searched lion cubs, and that's what they gave me. So they're growing lion cubs. That's what God's want. That's what is, it's his design, to, to him to what produce, like himself, on earth. Now, we're not gods. I don't, I'm not preaching the gods, uh, that we are God's teaching. That is false, and that is incorrect. But we are his representation here on earth. And he doesn't want get close. He wants a full representation of himself. And he's a warrior. And he's a fighter. And he's never going to lose. And if we understand that our Heavenly Father will never, ever, ever, ever lose a battle, then words like can't, not possible, can't do it, should not be our vo- in our vocabulary. We are Americans, not American. So we can uh, my family knows that my biggest pet peeve in life are three things, lying, manipulation, and, uh, and the word can't. I don't know why these three things, if you want to irritate me, do them. These are the one things that really bother me. Manipulation, lying, and I can't. It's not possible. Because if we are lions, born of God, it's the analogy again, he hasn't lost anything. Why are we going to lose? I think if only if we play the kitty cat games, that's the only way we're ever going to lose. Now we can put the original picture back up. I want to jump to the text a little bit, and I want to say, uh, disclaimer, I'm not going to make a separation between spiritual and physical, because we do know we're not, we're, we don't wrestle with the flesh and blood, but rather with spiritual beings. And we'll see in this text that we're about to go in that when we engage in a spiritual battle... It will always be followed by an action. There's gonna, always going to be an action involved when we engage in spiritual battles. Um, I want to just start from the first uh, part of, Sam, of chapter 1, from verse 1 to verse 8. And I named this passage, Adonai Tzevaot, for your marriage. And it goes like this. There was a certain man. This, okay, good. There was a certain man from Ramathayim, a, a Zophite from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zoph, an Ephraimite. He had two wives. One was called Hannah and the other Peninnah. Peninnah had children, but Hannah had none. Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts, the Lord of hosts, in Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Now I want to pause a little bit right there. Interesting that the way God wants to introduce to us this name of his, the Lord Adonai Tsevaot, as a fighter, he introduces it as in, in regards to a birth of a son. Keep that in mind. The Holy Spirit is the author of the whole scripture. There's always a messianic message in through the most powerful stories you might have learned in Sunday school. There's always going to be a messianic message behind it. And in this case, it's, it's, it's not um, excluded. Again, we see this passage of the birth of a son. He, he, he regards to himself as Adonai Tsevaot. Why is that important? Because the Holy Spirit chooses to mention that the sons of Eli were there, 
Hophni, and Phinehas. Now, if you know who the sons of uh, Eli were, they committed in a, unpronounceable things from the pulpit um, by the altar. They were corrupt priests, sons of the high priests, and God's about to bring and make war against the corrupt priesthood. Think about that. And he says, I am Adonai Tzevaot. The first time it's mentioned is when he's about to take the battle into the enemy's territory, something Jesus has done at the cross. Used the least of the least into a Roman-occupied uh, nation to what? To defeat the enemy on his turf, sort of speak. And he does it the same way in this case. He said, listen, I'm about to make war. And a Jewish uh, reader would say, oh, something's about to go down. Why is Yadonai Tseva Ot from a birth of a son? As we keep going, it says that whenever the day came from Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife, Panina, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion. This is, again, very messianic, very Jesus-like to use the weaker things of this world to shame the wise. Pay attention. It's very much a gospel message in all of this. He would give a portion, okay, and all her sons and daughters. But Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her. And the Lord had closed her womb because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb. Her rival, again, we have an enemy, kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival, interesting, no longer opinion, her rival now, it's mentioned two, three times, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Doesn't the enemy try to provoke us and take us to some places where we are just a mess. Her husband, Alkana would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Don't, why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than 10 sons? Interesting. So before um, uh, Alkana shows us that he's just an average man, hey, no, am I not worth more than sons to you? He has a moment where he has the father's heart, where it says... He has a double portion for Hannah. He looked at her, she was barren. She saw that she was being provoked. She saw that she was being tormented. And in a moment, we see the father's heart in, her, in, in Elkanah by being there for his wife. And I'm gonna say this, um, marriage is too, divide, too divine to allow Satan to divide it. It's too divine and too sacred. And the enemy will be there to torment us and to provoke us and to try to destroy the sacredness of God. Marriage is God's institution. It's not man's. Just make that clear. He is the inventor of marriage. And I think the problem as a church that we don't fight, we don't invite Adonai Tzavaot in our marriages enough. Because for the sake of not being embarrassed, we hide issues and troubles and because we don't want to be embarrassed, don't, don't let that person know that I'm dealing with some stuff in my own home. And that's a shame. Because if marriage is divine, we constantly try to fight it in a physical realm, and it's impossible because marriage is divine. You have to fight it in a divine way. You have to appeal to Adonai Tzevaot in the spiritual realm and invite him to fight in your home. You know, we got married young. I was 19, Anna was 18. And for a while, we didn't fit anywhere. I didn't fit in with my friends because they were not married. And I didn't fit in with the older generation because I was just a young guy who got married. And uh, I remember we would serve. I would serve at Sunday school. She would serve at nursery. And after church, we literally fit nowhere. Nowhere. Like, we were lonely. And when I mean lonely, I mean everybody knew us. Everybody said hi but you have nobody to connect with. So Sunday night after Sunday night, we got our bags, went in our car and drove home or go to our in-laws or go to my parents and have dinner with them. We had nobody to hang out with because we fit nowhere. Then our daughter came again, even more gap. Even the gap got bigger between us and our old friends because now we had children and he didn't. 
So we fit nowhere. So for the first three to five years, internally, it was like Israel and Palestine in the same perimeter. We were different. I came from different backgrounds. I expected things a certain way. She came from a different background, family, and she's from Arad, so you know how it is. So we had all these differences, and we had to put aside. And there was nobody to go to and say, I, I need help. So we tried to fix our issues in the physical realm, while marriage is divine. You can't fix it. So we had this internal battle all the time, back and forth, threats of this, threat on, threats of the D word flowing around, if you know what I'm talking about in my home. And I think the problem is we don't speak about stuff like this in church enough. The church is not made up of members, but families. Keep that in mind. Not members, not donors, families. If you want the church to stay united as a church, the families need to stay united. When somebody goes to troubles and issues, we don't point fingers and say, aha, this happened and this happened, and we start to blaming him, and we start to pick and choosing sides. It's foolish and immaturity. If we truly care about God's design, we will lend a, help, a hand, a helping hand. How can I help? How can I pray? Do you know Adonai Tzavaot will fight for you? So first thing, Adonai Tzavaot for your marriage. Invite them there. Align or come along with the families who may struggle. Don't judge and pick your side. It's immature. Let's talk about this more, guys. Let's talk about stuff like this more. We don't rejoice when people split. We don't say, aha, finally. No. Come along. There's a healing process. Come along, people. Come alongside. How can I help? What's going on? Adonai Tzavaot is willing if you ask. He's willing if you ask. He's a co-laborer. He could have easily uh, fulfilled all the promises in the scriptures all by himself. But guess what? He likes to co-labor with his people. He's the commander. I'm part of his army. He wants to co-labor with me. He wants to co-labor in your marriage. Uh, he wants to co-labor in every aspect of your life. Fight the battles you fight. He wants to come alongside, but understand that he's the commander-in-chief. We're the soldiers. Second, Adonai Tzavaot for your children. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 11, it says that she made a vow saying, Lord of hosts, imagine the first when she needed help. She didn't go to cousin, brother, sister, father, mother, in-law. She went saying, Lord of hosts, Adonai Tzavaot. If you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me, do not forget your servant, but give her a son. Then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. The spiritual battle, what? It was followed by an action, by a promise. I will dedicate him to you. Just give me a son. I will dedicate him to you. Just give me a son. Many times I think we ask God for children. When they come in this earth, we spoil them, and they become the most rotten children around our churches and schools. There's no dedication to the Lord. They're just, let me bow tie you and all this stuff, and, and, and spoil them. And then we create the best version of ourselves of them, and they're not the best version of who God wants them to be. And then also as we go on in, in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 17 through 18, because of her dedication, she prayed, she fought her battle in prayer, appealed to the Adonai Tzavaot, and there was an action involved because every spiritual battle does follow by an action. I will dedicate him. Because the result of that, what happened? In 1 Samuel 2, verse 17 and eight, verses 17 and 18, it says, The sin of the young men, these young men is Hophni and Phinehas, was very great in the Lord's sight. For they were treating the Lord's offering with contempt. But Samuel, ministering before the Lord, a boy wearing a linen ephod. That is a powerful message. So in the midst of this craziness, this corrupt priesthood that's going on, 
And many of us, we put our kids in private schools and we homeschool and we do all these things to protect them from this world because it's crazy out there, guys. It's nonsense. I have a friend in, in, in Dublin, Ireland, who's saying that the churches are uniting both Americans and Romanians are, uni are, are uniting against this crazy curriculum that's about to be poured in their school system. And they're fighting against it with their own curriculum. All of a sudden, the barriers, are, the barriers are down. They're all one church, glory to God, uniting to make a difference. And yes, it's crazy out there, but guess what? When we fight our battles for our children in the spirit realm, there's an action that follows in the physical. He always does. But there's a result of God because he brings the victory. And the victory is this. Then the worst priesthood, the prophet Samuel, is ministering as a priest. That's what the linen, linen ephod meant. That he had priestly clothing on himself as a boy in the worst priesthood of that time. How bad was that priesthood? It caused the presence and the glory of God to depart from Israel. But God, remember, he introduces his name as Adonai Tzvah'o because there's a battle that started. So we're still in the midst of battles. Sometimes our battles for our families and for our children seem that they take forever. God, hurry up like those test results. Just hurry up. You can do it. But there's a process which God chooses to. Why he does it, I don't know. But he does it. But there's a continuing battle, and we got to stay consistent and understand that Adonai Tzavaot is undefeated. Amen. And I want to say Adonai Tzavaot for the world. And it's the last point I want to make. And um, 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 17 through 22 says this. And this is a sad story. I'm going to read it all. It says, The man who brought the news replied, Israel fled before the Philistines. And the army has suffered heavy losses. Also, your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead. And the ark of, of God has been captured. When he mentioned the ark of God, he, Eli fell backward off his chair by the side of the gate. His neck was broken and he died. For he was an old man and he was heavy. He had led Israel 40 years. His daughter-in-law, the wife of Phinehas, was pregnant and near the time of delivery. When she heard the news of the ark of God had been captured and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she went into labor and gave birth, but was overcome by her labor pains. As she was dying, the women attending her said, Don't despair. You have given birth to a son. That was a good thing. But she did not respond or pay any attention. She named the boy Ichabod, saying, The glory has departed from Israel. Because of the ark captured, because the, of the capture of the ark of God and the deaths of her father-in-law and her husband, she said, the glory has departed from Israel and the ark of God has been captured. Let me tell you something. If that ended like that, there'll be no hope for Israel. But remember, we're in a battle. From the first chapter of Samuel, Verse 1, we're in a battle. We're continuing the battle. And let me tell you something. As sad as this sound, and many, many of us go in this world and saying, God has left. He has left this planet and is living on Mars. He's no longer has nothing to do with this world. It's done. But not so. Because about 80 years after Samuel was born, he was about to bring a man in place, anoint a man as king, who would bring the ark back, the presence of God back in Israel. Glory to God. Because again, Adonai Tzavaot doesn't lose. He has never lost and he never will. And that's when we get to the passage from 1 Samuel uh, chapter 17, verse 45. David said to the Philistine, and you can tell this is just the beginning of his ministry. You come against me with a sword, spirit heavily, but I come against you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Let me tell you something, church. We live on this planet, and sometimes we feel like we're defeated and we're done for. But God is not done. Because as we mentioned from the beginning, is if his word said it, then it is so. If his word said it, then it's going to be 
like that. What Adonai Tzevaot has not plan to do, and, and what he starts, he finishes. And when he starts, he's a step ahead of the enemy. It doesn't matter what we deal with in this world. If we understand that he goes before us, if we understand this truth of the word of God, that if he goes before us, we are literally untouched. You can call yourself untouchable because the enemy cannot hurt you. He may try to, you know, like a kitty cat, scratch and bite you, but he has no chance. I don't know about you, but tonight I choose to put my faith and my hope in Adonai Tzevaot over my being, because first of all, you know what they say, before you got to help someone in the plane, you got to put your own oxygen mask on before you start helping people around you. You got to make sure you're good before you start helping people. So Adonai it's about for me, for my wife, for my family, for everything I do. I, I'm relying on him. I got nothing to, to, to rely on if I, if I look at myself. But if I look at him, I won. You won. We're going to have an inheritance, the kingdom of God, a, a heavenly reward in the presence of the living God, rejoicing forever and ever and for all eternity. Amen. At this time, as we get ready for communion, I would like the worship team to uh, lead us there, and uh, we'll continue uh, the night. Amen.